We were talking this morning a little bit about two mothers, two covenants, and two sons, right? So we're going to try to pick up and maybe put a little bit of a bow on a few things this evening that are pertinent to what we were talking about this morning as it relates to this allegory between Hagar and Sarah, which is the covenant at Sinai or the covenant of promise that was made before of God in Christ, as the Bible says. And that promise was given and received to Abraham. And we're going we're gonna to try to, to put some particular bows on specific aspects of these things that we looked at in a general way this morning. It talked about the way that basically the two camps, uh, we use the term Bible believers very generally today. But that's, um, that's very loose. Uh, Bible believers can be a lot of things. What God is looking for and what we saw from uh, the allegory this morning between Isaac and Ishmael is we're looking for promise believers, people who have believed the promise of God that is in Christ. The Bible says that all the promises of God in Christ are yea. In other words, if you go to the Bible and you find a promise that God made, we looked at one this morning in Genesis chapter number 16. You find a promise that God made, you can mark it down. Its answer, the answer to that promise, is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just how, that's how this word is written. So every answer to every promise that we are looking for, that, then that's the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment. He is the completion. He is the perfection of every promise that God made of his perfect will, of his revelation to man, of his plan of redemption. In everything, you will find the answer to every promise, every question, every understanding we seek. It's found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we talked about two mothers, two covenants, and two sons. And we're looking specifically at Galatians chapter number four. And we can turn back there uh, briefly. We're going to start there. We're not going to necessarily spend a lot of time there this evening because we did that this morning. But in the book of Galatians chapter number 4, specifically what's being put in view for us is the fact that in Scripture, by the Holy Spirit, recorded for us is this allegory between this relationship Abraham had with Hagar, which was a relationship of the flesh, which produced a child which was of the flesh, and how that that allegory is a type of the covenant that was made at Sinai which basically told man, if you can keep this standard of righteousness, then you can live by it. In other words, the onus was on man to enjoy relationship with God according to that old covenant man had to obey. You will find if you study that covenant that the obligation was on man to obey and God would bless according to the level of obedience that the nation participated in in that covenant. And even in that covenant, we find the Lord being very gracious, knowing uh, that his people were not capable. But nonetheless, the people obligated themselves to that covenant and said, every word that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Come to find out, we can't, which is exactly the purpose of the first covenant. So the appeal of the first covenant is what? Because it puts in view works of men. Who was making the sacrifices in the first covenant? Men were. They were preparing them. They were bringing them. They were offering them. Everything that's in view in the first covenant is, can man attain unto God's standard of righteousness? And of course we know he can't. Which is why there was a place sought for a better covenant. Not that the first covenant was bad, It was good, and it was holy, and it was righteous. And Paul even said, verily, if there had been a commandment that could have given righteousness, or could have given life, then righteousness would have been by the law. But tonight, what I want to unpack a little more particularly is the blessing of Abraham. Because what's really in view with these two covenants is which one of these sons, right? Ishmael, that was also named by God, and also had uh, some promises given to him, also bore 12 princes, uh, became a type of those, the spiritual type of children of Abraham who are after the flesh, 
or of the works of man, as Ishmael was a type of that. And we have Isaac, who was the son of promise, who was basically a gift that God gave. And we're going to look at some things that I hope will put this in a better context for you this evening. First of all, I want to kind of recap. If you can't see this, you're free to move up closer. I say that every time. I don't think anybody's ever moved, but nonetheless, you're free to move up closer. So with Hagar, we have what? The covenant at Sinai. So as we, as we kind of look at what this is talking about, juxtaposed to that, we have Sarai, which is the covenant of promise. In other words, God gave his word. He's going to keep his word in a way that demonstrates to man, you didn't have anything to do with it, right? It's, it's completely beyond your natural ability. It wasn't beyond Abram and Sarai's natural ability to come up with a scheme that included Hagar, the young Egyptian maid, to be able to bear a child for Sarah. Right? That, that's perfectly within and actually probably what we expect to find where human reason is at work. And so we find that God refused Ishmael as the heir because it was a product of Abraham's works. And God said, no, that's not how this relationship is going to work. I'm going to refuse him as the heir. And he reiterated to Abraham, I will give you a son, right? Your, your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son. And that was the promise that he had. So these things are set. We have one that was a bond woman and one was a free woman. We see in the story and life of Abraham that this Egyptian maid that came uh, from Egypt into Abram's household and was in this covenant relationship with Abraham, according to the things of the flesh, represents in type the nation of Israel, which also came out of Egypt, came into the wilderness, entered into a relationship with God at Sinai. And that covenant was based on the things of the flesh, the works of man. And we see it was wholly inadequate because of the weakness of the flesh. If it wasn't for the fact that you and I are sinners, the first covenant would have served just fine. It would have been just fine. But we see that even with Adam and Eve, the system that says man must do fails. Because even Adam and Eve, with a perfect environment in a perfect setting, everything was great. They were under a system that said, if you can if do this, everything will stay fine. That didn't last very long, because it turns out man can't do that. So that whole system of thinking is what got us in this mess in the first place. That's why the law was added. We'll talk about that maybe another time. So Hagar speaks of the things of the flesh or the works of the flesh is the argument Paul is presenting in Galatians. It's everything about the works of man. So when you start doctrinally getting into ideas of doctrine that pertain to adding things to the gospel that are man-based, it's what man does to either complete the work of God or to perfect the work of God just, just consider that that's not possible. That anything a man could do would perfect what Christ had begun. Christ's work was perfect. It was perfect in every way, and it's wholly sufficient for the redemption of mankind, and it meets every need we have on its own. You can't perfect it. You can't add to it. You can't glory in it. You get nothing. You get no credit. All you get to do is to plead the blood of Christ by the promise of God that says those who believe will be forgiven, given eternal life and inheritance in the kingdom of God. All the promises we have in Christ that are yea. Contrarywise, Sarai was by promise. Hagar speaks of the law of works. Paul goes to great lengths to talk about the fact that righteousness, neither righteousness nor an inheritance in the kingdom of God is based on the law of works. And he says, actually, that boasting is excluded by the plan of redemption that God had for mankind, but boasting is not excluded by the law of works. Paul makes that point very clear in the book of Romans. He says that boasting is not, he says, by what law? Of works? Nay, but of the law of faith. See, if there's works in it, it includes some boasting. Because you say, yep, that was all me. I figured that out and I got it done. But the plan of redemption that God has for man, as we know from uh, Ephesians and other places that we can look at, tells us very plainly it excludes boasting. So it's not the law of works, it's the law of faith. The covenant at Sinai was the law of works. It says, if you can obey, right? So we, we go to the Old Testament, we look at the covenant at Sinai, 
And everything about it says, if ye will obey, if ye will obey, if ye will obey, if ye will obey. It, it kind of leads you to believe after a while when you study it, the key was obey. So in order to enjoy the covenant, you had to obey. In our covenant and the new covenant of Jesus Christ, which he brought, not the law, but he brought grace and truth, and he brought to us the gospel. We talked about how the fact this morning, the, the law given at Sinai isn't called the gospel anywhere in scripture. But the promise given to Abraham is specifically called the gospel. And you see the gospel going all the way back to Adam and Eve. So the gospel has been around, which is the promise of God, versus what man can do by his own works. So we have a mother and children cast out without inheritance. And this is where we're getting down to the substance of the issue for tonight. Because this is everything to do with inheritance. It's everything to do with inheritance. And we're going to look at this uh, pretty particularly tonight so that we can understand when God was having a conversation with Abraham about inheriting the land of Canaan, Abraham knew and confessed, as did Isaac and Jacob, that they were pilgrims and strangers in the earth. They never expected that God was speaking to them of the land they would inherit in this life. It wasn't their hope. It wasn't their expectation. They never took God to mean that. He said, you're going to inherit it. Where is the inheritance for man? It's not on this side of the grave. It's not on this side of the grave. And we have to understand the conversation God is having with Abraham and the fact that Abraham lived in a tent as a sojourner and a stranger, but yet he knew God has promised this to me for an inheritance. What's happening in that conversation? It doesn't have to do with the natural things of this life as we think of them. Over and over in the word of God, you hear about a world to come. Jesus Christ even said, they that shall be accounted worthy of the resurrection and to attain that world. The world that is to come. Not the present world in which we live. We're talking about an inheritance that's in a world yet to come. It's future to us. It's not to do with this present world system that we see and think of and enjoy today. Because of sin, this whole world and its system is, is already condemned. God is going to destroy it. He's going to remake it. He's going to reconstitute some things. And when we have been perfected, then we will be allowed to be placed into the inheritance he has prepared for us and we'll be able to enjoy it because we will then be immortal as God is. So when we have been set free from sin and death, we can actually enjoy the inheritance that he has prepared for us. But it doesn't have to do with the things of the here and now. We're going to probably look at this next week, but I'm going to... I'm going to give this one away tonight and this is free <laughs> this one's free Esau said what what good is this birthright if I die I'm letting you marinate on that one for a minute he said what good is this birthright if I perish What's he interpreting all the promises to have to do with right now? Right now. In his mind, if I die, I can't enjoy the blessing, which is absolutely contradictory to the faith we have, which says I must die to ever enjoy the blessing. <laughs> I'm not going to enjoy it the way God intends for me to enjoy it in this fleshly body. Right? You've got the trick knee. You've got the bad back. You've got the gout in your foot or whatever you got going on, right? We have lots of problems in the flesh, and we have sorrow, and we have despair, and then we've still got death looming out in front of us. So whatever amount of enjoyment we can have, you've always kind of got death hanging out in front of you that you're not going to get to enjoy it. God has already dealt with all that, and from the time of man's earliest days, he was speaking to men of spiritual things that lie beyond the grave for us. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob knew it. Their children forgot it. But they knew it. Let's look at some of this that has to do with the blessing of Abraham. If you turn to Genesis chapter number 28, 
I don't know that we ever even read anything out of Galatians 4. That was just to warm up your fingers. <laughs> Genesis chapter number 28. Verse number one, it says, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. There's some things in this text, in this passage of Scripture that's preserved for us by the Spirit of God you need to hear, and you need to consider, and you need to understand. In verse number 4 specifically, what's the second word of that verse? Give. It's a gift. Okay? Isaac is, is giving Jacob some instruction he's going to need, and he says that God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people and give thee. You see, there's, there's nothing there to require something of Jacob. This is a, he's passing on the promise that Abraham had received. Isaac now possesses the promise. He's passing on the promise to Jacob. And he's talking about a gift that God is giving. Why? Because of the promise. This, this promise is not contingent upon uh, someone's, you know, you have to obey this ten set of commandments and you have to do all these sacrifices and observe all these Sabbaths. Here's the list of the holy days. Here's the way the sacrifices are to be observed. There wasn't all that. He's saying he's going to give you the blessing of Abraham. What is the blessing of Abraham? When you go to Galatians, and it talks about the fact that we are also made partakers of the blessing of Abraham. What is the blessing of Abraham? If you're made a partaker of it, what is it? What's the blessing of Abraham? That's really what's in view. Because God had promised that he would give a son and that that son would be the heir of the promise and the blessing that God had promised to Abraham. So we're going to unpack this a little further, but keep that in the back of your mind. The Lord's talking about something very particular as it pertains to the blessing of Abraham. He says, give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest, what? Inherit. So Isaac's telling Jacob that this blessing, the blessing of Abraham that's been passed down, is available to him, and that the Lord is able to give it to him, and that if he possesses, if he receives that promise and that blessing that it brings, that it will involve an inheritance. An inheritance. Now remember, from a scriptural standpoint, we will never possess anything in this life. The Bible's already declared the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Nothing on this earth can be given to you to possess because you're going to die. So God can't give you your possession before your death. You won't be able to possess it. So he's talking about something that he's going to inherit. But notice what he says. You're going to inherit the land wherein thou art a... Stranger. So he's talking about an inheritance that's yet future, that you will have the promise of inheriting this land wherein you are a stranger. That is our lot in life as well. So we are, we are looking at this promise that they've received, and it has everything to do with inheriting this land. When God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, what did he tell him? I will give you a land. So I'm going to show you a land that I'm going to give to you. So this whole idea of inheriting, which laser pointers don't work on screens, the whole idea of inheriting has to be understood that that inheritance, while we 
tend, because we are natural-minded creatures, to think of the natural lineage to the seed of Abraham and their... Uh, hey, there's a laser pointer. Where'd that come from, Josh? <laughs> Thanks for helping me out there. Put it on the word inherit. There, yeah, just do this. Inherit. That whole idea of inheriting, while we think of the natural sense of Jacob's seed after him, eventually laying claim to the land when? 430 years later, after they come out of Egypt and God gives them the land, but God told Abraham he would inherit it. Isaac's here telling Jacob, you're going to inherit this. So the promise of God, the blessing of Abraham, is more than someday some future generation from you on this earth is going to actually be able to call this home, whereas you can't. The, the promise was to them. So what's in view is not the, the current uh, flow through time of the pressing on of possessions on this natural earth the way we think of it. There's something in view that is, that is more than that. I want you to turn to Galatians chapter number 3. You can get your fingers worked out this evening a little bit. And why is this important is because we are made partakers of the blessing of Abraham, right? So if you expect in your mind that the inheritance you're looking for and the blessing you're looking for has to do with right now, then you've misunderstood the gospel. The gospel has to do with the world that is to come and whether or not you have a stake in it. Because flesh and blood cannot inherit. So what's in view is the fact that as long as you are a flesh and blood creature, you cannot have any portion in the world that is to come. You are, you're disallowed because of your sin. You can't enter in. All through, the, all through Christ's ministry, he talked about entering in. Enter into what? So all this begins to make sense when we understand the inheritance that was promised to Abraham. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 14. You guys have already kind of read this because it's up on the board there probably. We can start reading in verse number 10. For as many as are of the what? Works. So which covenant is that? That's Hagar. That's the covenant of bondage. And when entering into that covenant relationship with God brings a curse. It can never impart a blessing. It brings a curse upon us because we cannot keep it. And so when we enter into a relationship with God based on what we do to earn his favor, we end up cursed for it because we can't ever do that. The Bible has made it clear that if that's our, if that's our mindset in this relationship, that we come to him under the works of the law, then we are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Why would God strip the nation of Israel of their temple? The temple was required for their covenant. He took it away. They cannot continue in all things written therein. It's not within their power. When God said, I'm going to take your temple away, they were powerless to stop it. What are they to do then? You see the problem with believing that it's under our power? When God determines to destroy your temple that's required for your service and your worship to continue in all things, what do you do then? See, the problem is they'd grown so self-dependent in their religion, thinking that they were keeping the law and they were pleasing God and they were the chosen seed, they were the children of Abraham, it was all about them. And so God says, well, what if I destroy your temple? Then what are you going to do? Now, are you going to acknowledge at this point that you're under a curse? That you are not able by your own strength to continue in all the things that are written? And guess what? Some of them did. Many of them would not. It says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith but the man that doeth them shall live in them. In other words, if it was a set of requirements you could meet and then God would accept you, 
That has nothing to do with faith. Faith is casting yourself at the feet of Christ, knowing you're worthy of condemnation and judgment and eternal hellfire, but throwing yourself at his feet and pleading his promise and his mercy. What do you have to trust in? Just the word that he left, the word of promise that says that you can be forgiven, you can be delivered, you can be given eternal life if you believe. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That what? The blessing of Abraham. Now we're talking. Now we're getting somewhere. So we who were apart from the promises of God, aliens uh, of Christ and without hope and without God in the world, we were brought nigh by the blood of Christ because the blood of Christ cleanses from all Sin. What is it that keeps us from inheriting? It's sin. It's the sin that has separated us from God, and we are dead in sins and trespasses, spiritually dead, unable to perform any works that are pleasing to God because we have no life to do them with. The only thing we can do is fleshly works. We looked at Ishmael this morning as a type of the son produced out of the Sinaitic Covenant. And what does he know? Only the things of the flesh. Has no spiritual insight, no spiritual life. Only what he's able to grasp and take by his own power. But the blessing of Abraham is available to us who are Gentiles, as it says in verse number 14, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of what? The Spirit through faith. Here's the thing. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. Your parents fathered you and mothered you after the flesh. In other words, a relationship between a natural father and mother produces children, but they fathered your flesh. In order for you to be born again, you have to be fathered by the father of spirits, as the Bible calls him. And he has to do a work in you, whereby you are born again spiritually. And when that happens, you are given this promise of the Spirit. So what happens when you're born again is that the Spirit comes in and you are regenerated by the Spirit of God. You are quickened and brought to life and all the sins you've committed... Are, are nailed to the cross with Christ and they're all paid for and gone and done away. And now you have the Spirit of God inside of you and it got there how? It got there by faith. And if you have the Spirit of Christ in you by faith, guess what you're made a partaker of? The inheritance. The inheritance that was promised to Abraham thousands of years ago that he's living in expectation of at this moment having still not received the fullness of the promise. But he's expecting it, and we are expecting it with him because we've been made partakers of that inheritance because the world that is to come is a world wherein dwelleth righteousness. And our flesh and blood cannot enter in to that kingdom. We cannot go in under the strength and power of our flesh. We're going to have to pass either through the veil of death or the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come for us and will be gloriously changed in a moment. But either way, that transformation has to be complete for us to enter in. That was Abraham's hope by faith. It's our hope by faith. Christ's sacrifice on the cross and the shedding of his blood was the fulfillment, the confirmation. As you read it in the book of Romans, that Jesus Christ came to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Why? Because sin had to be dealt with, and there had to be a way for us to be forgiven and declared to be righteous. Because righteousness is what's required to inherit. Because the world that is to come is an eternal world. It's without end. World without end, Paul says. So that's the world we're talking about. That's the world we're talking about being translated into by the power of God in Christ Jesus through faith in his name. When we believe the promise of God, 
that miraculous work is done in us by the Spirit of God, and we are now made partakers of this hope that Abraham had. So we see all the way back from Genesis, all the way to the book of Galatians, that the blessing of Abraham is what's in view. So, Romans 4.13, let's turn over there real quickly. These were my introductory slides, and these are my notes, which I haven't gotten to yet. So we'll probably leave some of this for another time. But I want you to understand this, because as it pertains to the gospel, this is what's in view. Paul said that uh, the churches, I think, was it, uh, which church was it? He said that they took gladly the spoiling of their goods, knowing that they have a better and more enduring substance laid up for them in the heavens. Right? So what's in view is the inheritance that was promised to Abraham, and whether or not you have a part in that inheritance, or whether you're going to pass off the scene when you die, not being regenerated by the Spirit of God, living out your whole life as a flesh and blood creature only, never having been made a partaker of the Spirit. The Bible says if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So you have no portion in Christ, and Christ is the promised seed. If you're not in Christ, you don't have a portion. If you're in Christ, you have the same portion he has, which is the entire created creation. Christ has been set to be Lord of all, to bring together in one both things in heaven and things in earth. Everything that the Father has ever created will be brought under the dominion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're in Christ, then you have a part in that. And if you do not have Christ, you do not have his spirit, you will pass off the scene and not enter in because you're flesh and blood. We're subject to death. You have to be... There's a reason that it's said in Scripture, ye must be born again. You must be. Otherwise, your life will come and go, and you'll face the judgment, and you'll be cast away, like the bondwoman and her son. If you're trusting in your works and in your righteousness and what you add to Christ, you will be cast out because you will not be an heir with the child of promise. So I hope you're beginning to put some of these things together. In Romans 4, 13, again, what's in view is talking about Abraham. In verse number 13, it says, For the promise that he should be the what? Heir, Heir of the world. which world? The world that is to come. It was not about this world and this life and that land of Canaan. It will be a renewed, refreshed Rest, uh, in the times of restitution of all things, God is going to do a work of restoration on this planet Earth. And Abraham was said to be made heir of that world that is to come. And how is it that he was made heir? By faith. You guys beat me to it. The promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. In other words, the law cannot guarantee you an inheritance because it does nothing to change your nature. You're still flesh and blood. You can strive in that relationship with that covenant at Sinai and be as sincere as you choose to be. You can work really hard at it. And you can spend your whole life just wearing yourself out trying to be as good as the law says you have to be. But the least of all saints who trust in the finished work of Christ, those harlots and publicans that the Pharisees couldn't stand, they're going into the kingdom. Because those who make it in are to be trophies of God's grace. That's the purpose of his whole plan of redemption, is to show forth his grace. And how can you do that? when people are striving by the works of the law to get in. It's no longer of grace. Paul makes that very clear. It wasn't of the law, but it was through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be what? Yeah. Heirs of what? The world that is to come. This is what's in view with the inheritance. If they which are of the law be heirs, 
Faith is made void. You see, you cannot have both. You cannot have both. It's either you're in by faith or you're out. It's either faith is void because there's some works mixed in and you're going to have to figure out what that looks like or it's all of faith and it's nothing else. But it says the promise would be made then of none effect. Now listen to what he's saying because who made the promise? It's God in heaven who made a promise. And the Bible tells us, and we know, that God cannot lie. Amen. Our attempts to sprinkle in the works and to make faith void is an attempt to make God's promise of none effect. It's just like Abraham and Hagar all over again in our own lives in a modern way. It's the exact same principle that we have in front of us this view of a promise, and we're going to figure out how by our works we can obtain it. And it won't happen. God will refuse any and all who seek to enter. Anyone who enters in, other than through the door, the same as a thief and a robber. If Ishmael decided that he wanted to have the inheritance, he would have to take it by force. He is now working against the promise of God. He's now made himself a thief and a robber by trying to lay claim to that which was never intended to be his because the promise of God ultimately will and must prevail over everything else, everything else. And that's exactly what's happening. And so Paul concludes in verse number 16, therefore, it is of faith. In other words, God's not a liar he will keep his promise, and it is of faith. It absolutely is of faith that it might be by what? Grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So, where do we go from there? Well, we have this whole idea of being the heir of the world, which is what's in view. That's the blessing of Abraham. That he was given a promise to be an heir of the world to come. And so the blessing of Abraham we are made partakers of when we come to Christ and trust in the promise that is left to us in his name. We become partakers of that. And it talks about the righteousness of faith. That is the gift. To inherit the world to come. If the world to come wherein dwelleth righteousness, for you to dwell there... Guess what you got to be? Now, I want you to imagine as hard as you can that there's any possibility that that's remotely true about any of us. It's absolutely not true. There is none righteous, the Bible says, none that doeth good, none that seeketh after him. All have gone astray. We're all turned out of the way. None righteous. But God promised. This is where God works. Because the promise will not be void. You see, God had determined before the foundation of the world was ever laid in his foreknowledge, knowing all things being the end from the beginning, he had already prepared the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for men, to put away sin for the express purpose that his promise not be null. That his promise not be void. The promise will not be void. The, the promise of God will not be made of none effect. And in order that he might keep his promise, he came to this earth in the person of Christ, suffered and died on the cross and shed his own blood and gave his life to put away sin that he might be just and the justifier of all them that seek unto him in faith. In other words, God kept his word. Amen. And he did it in a way, just like he did with Abraham and Sarah, that completely and expressly and utterly uh, disannuls any attempts on mankind's part to get any glory in it or to boast in it whatsoever. There is no boasting, the Bible says. It's completely excluded 
And we see that even in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 23, 6. It says, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Amen. If you know Jesus Christ, I hope you know him in this way. Amen. He is our righteousness. When we stand before the Father, we have the righteousness of Christ if we've come to him in faith. And we've pled the blood of Christ. And that blood of Christ has been applied to our hearts. And our conscience has been purified by that purifying blood of Christ. And the sins have been washed away. And when the Father looks at us, he sees, remarkably, he doesn't see us as we are. He sees us as he made us to be in the world to come through the blood of Christ, which is as righteous as Christ himself. You. And you, and you, and me, and everybody over here. If you're in Christ, that is what he's done for you. Amen. He's kept his promise in a way that gets him glory by showing forth his grace. And that is available to anyone who will believe. Amen. Faith is what's in view here, and it's what's required. Jeremiah 33, 16 reiterates the same idea. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely, and his name, and this is the name wherewith she shall, he, she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Second Corinthians five twenty one, for he made us to be, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So, the question for us is which covenant is more appealing? There's an awful lot of people still striving under the old covenant. Yeah. And by doing so, they make themselves the children of Hagar. They make themselves through that covenant the children that are to be cast out and have no inheritance because it only can ever deal with the things of the flesh. The law is not of faith, and whatever is not of faith is sin. Not that the law is sin. Paul makes that clear. The law is good. You're a sinner. And the law won't fix it. The law can't fix it. So if you're going to be made a partaker in the things that pertain to the blessing of Abraham, and the blessing of Abraham has everything to do with the gift of righteousness, because that's what was imputed to Abraham, because he believed God. And that righteousness that's imputed is what's necessary as a gift from God in order for you to become a joint uh, heir with Abraham and the blessing that he had, which was the promise to be the heir of the world. Not of this world, the prince of this world, uh, and all of his agents that run the things down here now for a season, they have a kingdom, and it's for a time, and it's limited to a day because it's not an everlasting dominion. And everyone who's under the dominion of that kingdom will pass away and be cast out, just like uh, the devil and all of his agents will be cast out. But those who have the gift of righteousness imputed to them by faith are those who are given the gift of the Spirit, because the Spirit is what's necessary for you to be able to inherit the world to come. This is what uh, these things are speaking to us of. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These words are the words of life. All who will come unto him and receive freely of the gift of grace and have imparted to them the righteousness of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, will receive the gift of the spirit of promise by faith. And that spirit coming in and indwelling is what's absolutely necessary for you to have any lot or inheritance or part in the kingdom of God. We will be inheritors. It's all about inheritance. and has everything to do with the world that is to come. So what's the best way to wrap that up now that I haven't gotten into my notes yet? <laughs> that was my, I was just trying to set the stage. Uh, but we'll just, uh, let me see. I do want to touch, let's finish up here. This will be a, a good place to finish. I want you to go to Genesis 16, 12.
and just put your finger there. And then, with your other hand, I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. You will see and notice, I think, the more that you study the Word of God, how, how modern theologians who believe the Old Testament's not necessary have no idea what they're talking about. I'm not sure that they've actually spent much time studying the scriptures because it's all there and you need all of it you absolutely need all of it to understand the things of christ so let's start in genesis chapter number 16 i want you to read uh, a bit of prophecy so this is the angel of the lord when he meets hagar after she had fled from the face of sarai and she's out in the wilderness and ishmael means what God will hear. Listen, if you're an Ishmael, because that's how we all come into the world, and you cry out to God, he'll hear. Amen. You see, the things of the Spirit aren't like the things of the flesh in this way. A leopard can't change his spots, but a God that has brought redemption through his son Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood is able to take an Ishmael and make him an Isaac. Amen. And those who are in the flesh... And they know, they come to the place where they realize their condition and they loathe themselves because of it. And they're looking in desperation for hope and they find it in Christ and they cry out to him. Amen. The name Ishmael is a promise. It says, God will hear. Amen. He'll hear your cries. And there's coming a time when he's going to hear the cries of the nation Israel. But I want you to notice this bit of prophecy that's given here in verse number 12. Speaking of Ishmael, the angel of the Lord says this, And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Prophecy. Agreed? Turning over to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. <clears throat> So the child that Hagar bore unto Abraham was of the flesh, right? That represented the covenant at Sinai. And it represents all those who are the children of Abraham according to the flesh by virtue of that covenant. Nodding of the heads. So any of those who are truly the children of Abraham after the flesh, but they're still under the old covenant of Sinai, they are represented by the son Ishmael and not Isaac. Ishmael, who, as I said, also bore 12 princes and, and many similarities between Israel and Ishmael. So we come to the book of 1 Thessalonians in chapter number 2 and we read this. And, and I hope you kept your finger in Genesis because I think you're going to have to flip back at least once to catch this. In verse number 14... Paul's writing, he says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the, what? Jews. Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they please not God, and are contrary to all men. So put your finger right there at the end of verse 15. Go back to Genesis. Read verse number 12 again. He will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man. Go back to 1 Thessalonians. They please not God and are contrary to all men. The Jews who cling to the Old Covenant, they become Ishmael. There's, the spiritual allegory is that they are the children of Hagar, the bondwoman. And in doing so, they actually, in themselves, fulfill the prophecy that God gave about the offspring of Ishmael. That they would be a wild man. In other words, they please not God. And that they would be contrary to all men. How is it contrary to all men? Paul goes on to explain there, and it's in several other places in the New Testament as well. That those Jews clinging to Judaism and that old covenant are the spiritual allegorical type of Ishmael and they fulfill that type 
exactly. And you'll go back to the, the Gospels and you'll see the Lord saying things uh, to the lawyers. Woe unto ye lawyers, for ye took away the key of knowledge. Ye, ye didn't enter in, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. What's he saying? It's the same thing. Contrary to all men. Those who add things to the law of Christ, add to the law, the law of faith, if you want to use uh, a scriptural term that doctrinally is consistent all the way back to Abel, uh, and the Lord even says of that generation that ye may be guilty of all the blood of all the prophets from righteous Abel all the way forward. So, so what's, what's going on with all of that? Well, what's going on with all of that is, um, oh man, I'm really trying to wind down. And I feel like I'm not winding down. But nonetheless, when you sprinkle things in with the gospel, and no longer it's gospel, it's now a covenant of works. It's the covenant at Sinai that says, if you work this out, then you can become a partaker in the inheritance, which was what that covenant was. It is scriptural. It's just completely unattainable. And it's, it still has to be on God's terms, not our own. That is contrary to all men. Why? Because it shuts up the kingdom. Because you cannot be a partaker. The, the Lord has already spoken that the bondwoman and her son are to be cast out. There's not an inheritance for them. Do you, do you get the picture of Abraham, who was a very wealthy man, who cast out the son and the woman, and they got no inheritance? There's no portion. There's nothing there for them. The scriptures testified, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of promise. So there is no inheritance for those. So what, are, what is happening with people who try to put works of men into the gospel? One, you're denying the sufficiency of Christ. You're saying that what he did is not enough and that we've got to do something else to add to it to improve on the righteousness that he had, to improve on the work that he did. And somehow we're going to perfect what Christ has already done. We're going to add something that makes it perfect because it's lacking in some way. Absolutely not. Anything we add into the gospel to make it based on that kind of a system means that it's not of faith, which means it's not of the Spirit, which means you will not inherit anything. There is no portion for you there. It's all about the inheritance it's all about the covenant, and it's all about promise. We find in Scripture, and I won't, I won't take time to go there. We'll, we'll begin to wind this down for this evening. But the entire purpose, the entire purpose of God doing things the way he has done, Paul tells us it's for a purpose. And it's that, in the ages to come, the exceeding riches of the grace of God and the mercy of Christ might be known through us. It goes right back to the parable of, or not the parable, the, the prayer of the Pharisee and the publican. When Christ looks at those men, he sees one that says that man is as he ought to be. And it's not the guy we look at and say, that guy's he's a good man. He's as he ought to be. He looks on the heart of this man. So we have to get to the place where we understand like Abraham did. Yes, we do things in the flesh. All of it makes life harder on us because it's, it's corrupt, right? But in order for us to escape, which is what the Bible says, to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust, we have to have the Spirit of God because the corruption that's in this world through lust is going to live with it until it's destroyed. So if we're ever going to live to see the world that is to come, in which Abraham was made heir of that world, and if we want to be an heir of the world that is to come, we must be in Christ, and the only way to be in Christ is by faith. And we must have the Spirit, and the only way to get the Spirit is through faith in Christ. But if we have the Spirit and we have faith in Christ, we have everything we need. Because he has done everything else. It's a completed work of Christ on the cross, and it can't be perfected or added to. It's perfect already. 
so much more to this um, that I would love to teach and go into. I think it's helpful. I hope that you understand the gospel of Christ has not as much to do with you enjoying your life tomorrow. <clears throat> it has not as much to do necessarily with you being healthy, wealthy, and wise for the rest of your natural days. Look at Jacob. I mean, he was called blessed in his life. Would you pick that life? I mean, it's so full of turmoil and trial and difficulty and hardship. But the Bible says he was blessed. Why? Because it didn't have to do necessarily with all that. Those are things that God uses and works through in spite of the sin that's in our flesh to accomplish his perfect will for the world that is to come. But make no mistake, the gospel of Christ that confirms the promises to the fathers and makes those promises available to us Gentiles has everything to do with the inheritance that's promised to Abraham pertaining to the world to come. That's our hope. That's why it's a gospel. It's good news. That's why it's a gospel of peace. And that's why it's a gospel of righteousness. And that's why it gives us hope through all the trials that we can bear up under because this life is just a season. It's just a, it's a vapor of a time. It's just a little while, the Bible says, and then it passes away. And for those who are in Christ, it's just getting good when you get to the death's door. It's just getting good when you get to that place in your life. And if Christ does come, we pray and look for the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. And if that does come and we're gloriously changed and we're of that few number that shout as we go through the air, O oh, death, where is thy victory? O oh, grave, where is thy sting? All the better. But we'll be changed nonetheless, just like we will be if we walk through even death's shadow. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. All of those men of faith were looking for the world to come. It's not as much to do with this present world. We're looking for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Amen. I appreciate your kind attention. This